Hi, I'm Carl Franklin. In episode 26, I showed you how to create a new Blazor server application with basic identity features for authentication and authorization. In this episode, I'll show you how to add identity to an existing Blazor server app. Next week, I'll show you how to add identity services to a Blazor WebAssembly application, which is a bit different. Adding identity. It's what's for dinner. Um, uh, oh, yeah. Right now, right here on Blazor Train. Okay, so just to reiterate, this is a Blazor server application. Um, we're going to add identity to it. And next week on the show, we'll add identity to an existing Blazor WebAssembly application. So the application is called Add Identity. And I'm going to start just by clicking on the project here because we're going to be doing some scaffolding. And uh, scaffolding is a feature built into Visual Studio that is sort of like code generation. And it's exactly like code. It is code generation. So it's going to create all of the stuff that we need. Well, almost all the stuff. But here's where we get started. We right click on the project name and select Add New Scaffolded Item. See that? So now we have this uh, dialog here. And I'm going to select Identity from the left. And Identity is the only item you can choose. Now, when I click Add, you're going to get an error message. So let's take a look at this. There was an error running the selected code generator. Install the package Microsoft Visual Studio .web .code generation design and try again. But notice that it added the package. The thing is, is that it didn't recompile. And so all you really have to do is say OK and click Add again. And now we have this nice dialog box, which allows us to pick the features we want. So we're going to check off login, log out, and register. Because that's basically the required features for auth, for identity. But look, there's all sorts of other features. I'm not going to go into all of these. Some of them require other services like email confirmation, a reset password, which does use email, needs an email service. So, and there's good documentation about all of these, but we're just going to stick with login, log out, and register. But we get this same game again about installed packages that it needs. So let's first start with this required item here, the data context class. We're going to just allow it to pick a name for us because it does need to create a data context, a DB context, so it can use Entity Framework to access the identity database. So we're just going to go with the default name and click Add. And again, we play this game of you need to recompile. And in the meantime, we're going to give you an error message. All right. So one more time, there we go. So you might think, oh, that's it. All right, well, no, not really. Let's take a look at uh, the data context itself, which is over in areas, identity data, add identity context, right? There's nothing there, really. So we have to generate a database and the database itself is defined in app settings json the add identity context connection which is using sql local db uh, and the database is add identity so if i go over to my sql object explorer and look at my databases it's not there yet so we have to generate all the stuff and the database around that and as a guide, I'm using the Microsoft documentation, Scaffold Identity in ASP.NET Core Projects. And if you scroll down to Scaffold Identity into a Blazor Server Project without existing authorization, this is where we're starting. 
and it's telling you to do exactly this stuff. Now, I will say one thing about this documentation. It's not really complete. Um, I had to use a combination of this document and this document to figure out how to do exactly what this document is telling me to do. So the next step is the migrations. Uh, it's asking me to install the package Microsoft ASP.NET Core Diagnostics Entity Framework Core, which is already installed. There it is right there. So I don't need that. Next, we're going to add a migration, and we can name it whatever we want. But I'm going to use their suggestion and name it Create Identity Schema. And for that, we go down to the Package Manager console, type that in right there, add dash migration, space Create Identity Schema. And now we get a Migrations folder over here. And in there, we've got our schema that we can now apply to create a database. And how I do that is I type in the package manager update dash database. Just like that. Says done. Now we can go over to databases and refresh and there's add identity. The next thing the documentation talks about is this anti-forgery token. Anti-forgery should be a, a clear goal. We don't want people accessing our application who aren't uh, allowed to. And one of the ways that hackers can get around security is cross-site scripting. And so what we're going to do is when the application runs, we're going to create a token. Think of it like a GUID but a, a token, a long security string. And we're going to pass that to the client, and the client then will pass it back on every request. So we can check that request, and we can go one step further. If we need to make an API call, we can pass that as our token, as our security token, so the API can authenticate us with that token. So I'm going to go ahead and do this. But first, we need to add uh, a class, and I'm going to add it over here in Areas Identity to represent that token. It's going to be called Token Provider. There it is. So in the documentation, they call this Access Token, and sometimes they call it XSRF Token. I'm just going with XSRF. Doesn't really matter. So next. We have to open the underscore host CSHTML page. And this is where we're going to generate the token and pass it into the application. So we're going to inject this anti forgery object here, XSRF. And then in this little code block, we're going to create a new token provider and set the XSRF token property to a new token. We're going to request a token and store it using this code right here. Now, how do we get that into our application? Well, we're actually going to modify our app, app.razor, to have a parameter for this token. And while this doesn't define the parameter, it passes it. So the parameter's name will be initial state. And we're going to pass this tokens object that I just created up here. So let's modify app razor to have that parameter and just in general to support off. All right, so it's going to complain about token provider. So therefore, let's go to our imports razor and add the namespace there, add identity, areas identity. That's where our token provider is over here. Save that. Back to App Razor. Why don't we just save everything while we're at it? So let's go over this. Uh, I've injected the token provider. The cascading authentication state wraps the router and everything else, therefore. And also, I've changed the route view to an authorized route view. Now, here's my token provider parameter, initial state. 
And when this guy loads up, we're going to set our token provider XSRF token, right? The token provider that was injected in to the initial state XSRF token, which was passed right here. What's cool about this is that I can access that token provider anywhere where I want to make an API call. And if you look at the documentation, this second one, uh, ASP.NET Core Blazor Server Additional Security Scenarios, you can see they have a demo of the weather forecast service, which would use the token provider, right, and pass that in through injection. And then if it's going to make an API call, it can pass that token as the authorization header. And uh, that is a necessary thing to do anytime that you're making an authorized API call. All right, now let's go to startup. We're going to add the token provider service. And down in app under use routing, I'm going to add use authentication, use authorization. And in the endpoint, because we're going to have some razor pages here, we're going to map those, map razor pages. So let's add some razor pages. We need to do this. Over in shared, I'm going to add a shared razor component called redirect to login. There you go. So we can use this anytime we want to redirect somebody to the login page with a return URL. Now let's make a login display. And you probably noticed if you saw the basic auth when you create a new project with authorization, with identity, um, that you get this login display component by default. But ours is going to be a little bit different. So take a look at what's going on here. We're passing in the token provider. We have a navigation manager. And we have an authorized view, which gives us an authorized and a not authorized section. And if we're authorized, we're saying, Hello, context user, identity name, and we're linking to uh, account manage index. And then we have a form with a button, and we need a form because we have this hidden input tag that has the cross-site anti-forgery token. And then if we're not authorized, it's giving us links to register and log in. Now, we need to put this in main layout right up top. And now we can register, we can log in, we can log out, but we're not really doing any kind of authorization. So let me show you how to do some simple authorization in three different ways. So let's go to fetch data. And I'm going to completely change this. So I've got an authorized view here. And if we're authorized, we'll show the UI. And if we're not authorized, we'll say something like, you are not allowed here, all right? Simple markup authorization. You have to be logged in in order to see the data. All right, here we are. We're definitely not logged in. So if I go to fetch data, I'm not allowed. Now I can't log in because I don't have an account yet. So let's register. Create my account my password, and register. Yes, I'll save the password. And now you have to click this. Click to confirm your account. So this is taking the place of email confirmation. You don't have an email service yet, so you just have to click that. Now I'm going to log in. And please remember me. Now I'm logged in. Hello. Carl at Franklin's net. So now if I go to fetch data, boom, there it is. All right, so that's one way to do it. For the next way, let's go to counter. And I'll change this as well. OK, now we've got a cascading parameter, task of authentication state. And if you look in App Razor, remember we had this cascading authentication state? that wraps the router and therefore wraps the app and everything else. So this is sort of in lieu of injecting, all right? I've created this cascading parameter, so I have this authentication state task. 
Now I have added a string display message, which I'm going to show right down here. And I've changed increment count to async task so that we can call await authentication state task. And then I'll get the claims principal user and check user.identity is authenticated. And if it's true, we'll increment the count. And if it's not true, we'll set the display message to you must log in first. So here we are. We've got our counter. We are logged in. So I can increment. If I log out and go to counter, wah, wah. All right, so that's another way that we can do checks of authentication, but this is with code. Now, there's another way that we can just disallow the user to see this page at all if they're not authenticated, which is with an attribute. Attribute authorize, right? And now we're saying you can't even see this page, any of it, unless you're authenticated. So we are not authenticated. We'll go to counter. It says not authorized. That's the default message. If I go to fetch data, we get the message from our code. You are not allowed here. So now I've effectively locked down this application in a couple of different ways. Just to make sure this works, we'll log in. Go to counter. There it is. Here's fetch data. Everything works. Now, we have secured the pages themselves, but we're still allowing people to go to these pages, uh, even if they're not authenticated. So wouldn't it be cool if we could just remove these guys from the nav bar if they're not authenticated? Well, sure. So we use the old authorized view trick. Uh, we're gonna do an authorized view. on these links. So authorized view by itself means we're only going to show these things if the user is authorized. There we go. We have home and that's it. We log in. Now we can go to counter and we can go to fetch data. There you have it. So if we were logged out, for example, and we just wanted to say go directly to counter, we'd still get not authorized. And fetch data isn't allowing us in. So it's all working. All the, the sentries are at the door. So that's all I got for this episode of Blazor Train. Next week, we'll do the same thing, but in a WebAssembly application. Back to you in the studio, Carl. Oh, oh, sorry. You caught me listening to some tunes. Hey, uh, thanks for riding the rails with me today. This is where I jump off. I'll see you next time. Blaze a train.